So we played a, a little bit, and it just, you know, it just, you know, went together just, you know, so smoothly. So he said, listen, I've got a couple of jobs, um, gigs that I'm going to do, and I'd like you to come and play guitar with me. And I said, oh, I, I, I can't do that. I'm, I'm with a group, and, uh, and we don't go off and do stuff. And he said, well, we got to figure out, you know, how do we work this out? So I thought for a second, I thought, if I could get Levon to come with me and do this, maybe we could, maybe that would work. And it's just a couple of jobs, and you know. So anyway, I told him, I said, well, if I could get, you know, my, my bandmate Levon to play drums in this, maybe we could do it. So it took a little bit of doing, but he, he ended up making this happen. So Levon and I played at Forest Hill Stadium in New York with him, and then the Hollywood Bowl. We had never played. That was more applause than you got at either of those places. <laughs> we, we didn't know. We didn't know what we were getting into. And so when we played at Forest Hills, and so there was some other musicians that had played on Bob's record or something that, were, that we were playing with for these couple of jobs. So we go out and we're gonna play, and during the sound check in the afternoon, Bob says, listen, no matter what happens, don't stop playing. <laughs> now, I didn't really know what that meant yet, right? Okay, you know. Uh, we won't, we won't, we'll keep playing, you know, I, to get to the end of the show, the set, whatever. So we go, we start playing, people start charging the stage and throwing things and screaming and booing. And it's quite a feeling <laughs> when you, you, you go out in front of an audience and there is this really angry, attitude coming at you, you think, what the hell? What, what, you know, why, why is everybody so upset? Now, we had heard a little bit about the, the Newport Festival. That, it, that was a folk festival, right? This isn't a folk festival. So anyway, we played these first two jobs. After the thing, Bob says, that was great. <laughs> Let's do a whole tour. <laughs> so I was like, what? What is this guy on? You know, like, my God, that, you know. So then we said, you know, you know, and he wanted to continue it. And we said, no, 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 we have a group. So anyway, he came and heard us play, said, this is terrific. We started playing together a little bit. And he decided, okay, we would all, you know, the Hawks, would be the group that plays with him, taking him electric, right? So, we go and do a tour of North America, Australia, and all over Europe, and every night, people boo us <laughs> and throw stuff at us. So, normally, when this happens, in the North American tour, halfway through it, you might say to yourself, are we doing something wrong? <laughs> Why do people hate this so much? Is it that bad? Is what's going on here? Because normally somebody would say, oh, we need to make some adjustments. The audience isn't appreciating what we're doing. No. No, that was not the way this works. This was called, no, play faster, harder, and louder, right? And so, yes, yes. So this goes on and on, and, and there were, in the middle of all of this, the sound man would record some of the shows and we would listen to them and after the show you know I'd say 
this song, it's a, you know, why don't we slow this down just a touch here? And this intro, you know, maybe we could, you know, we could cut it in half. And there was things that you would do just to make your arrangements and the music a little bit better and better all the time. Not that the audience cared in the least about these adjustments. So this goes on and on, and at a certain point, in this tour, we were listening to the show that we had done that night. And I said to the guys in the Hawks, and I said to Bob, they're wrong. This is really good. They are wrong. The world is wrong. And we are right. That's when you know that's when you know that you're in a musical revolution because there is no indication outside of your own awareness, your own ears, that, that you are doing something. And so anyway, in all of this stuff, it just made us feel bold and made us feel like, you know what, in your face. We are going to play this music and you're going to have to deal with it because we're not changing a note. And history has spoken. 50 years later, we love that music. We can't get enough of it. Finally! <laughs> a series of events following that, including uh, Bob Dylan's motorcycle accident, has you looking for a place to rehearse. A clubhouse, in Rick Danko's words. What did you find up in Woodstock, or near Woodstock, West Socrates, I guess? Well, this was, first of all, it was Albert Grossman's idea, because in this city, you know, it was now, after Bob had his, his mo motorcycle accident and had to recuperate, it was now time for the Hawks, for us to start putting together our music. This was a temporary thing, playing with Bob. We were just doing that to get to the to the next place in our journey. That was all understood by everybody. So Albert says, because in the city, you know, we tried to play at places and we were always bothering somebody. You know, we couldn't do this, we couldn't do that, it's too late, it's too early, all of this stuff. So Albert says, come up to Woodstock. You won't have any problem like that at all. You know, and you, you'll have all of this, you know, the, the, all, all, all of the quiet that you could possibly need, and you could make all the noise that you possibly need. So anyway, it was Rick. Rick found this ugly pink house outside of, of Woodstock and West Saugerties. It's out in the middle of a hundred acres. And we thought, we could make some noise out here. And this was, this had been a dream of mine to have a place, a workshop, where we could go and create and, and figure out and how the Hawks could gather our musicality and put it into a place of songs and everything and present what we have been putting together for all of these workshop years on, on the road. So we get this house, and I go in there, and in the basement, it's a thing of beauty to me. We can set up our equipment down there, and, you know, and with some microphones and a little mixer and everything, and we could start creating something. Something. I just knew it was, it, it was there for the taking. So, one day, I take Bob out there to show him our clubhouse, our workshop. He goes in, he sees the place, and he, and he can't, at first he doesn't relate, because he's only recorded in recording studios, like, you know, most people. And I take him down in the basement, and he sees this setup, and he's like, whoa. He says, can you, how does it sound in here? How, can you, can you record something in here? And I said, we got a little tape recorder, and microphones and everything. And he says, I got a couple of songs I'm kicking around. Maybe we could try them out here. 
right? So this was the very beginning of the basement tapes. <laughs> which went on to become this, this a phenomenon of some kind of a bootleg record, these things. We went there every day. We went there and just showed up at the clubhouse, and hung around. Bob, Bob wrote songs on a typewriter. You know, songwriters, you know, you always hear, oh, you know, he wrote the me a melody and now he'd like someone to write the lyrics or something. No, he sat down at a typewriter, wrote out a whole bunch of words, and then would figure out what those words sound like. I'd never seen that before. I, I don't know anybody that did that. I don't know if anybody does do that, actually. But anyway, he would be click, ding, ding, and he would you know, type out a thing, and we'd go down in the basement, and, and most of this music was just for us. It was a very personal thing. It wasn't meant for anybody to hear, but it was so much fun what we were doing. And I would say that I would mention some obscure song or something, boom. And he not only knew all the words to his songs, he knew the words to hundreds of other people's songs. And he would just sing the song and we would record it. So it was all part of the basement tapes. And out of that, the songs for music from Big Pink. You mentioned North Americana before, and I guess I'm curious to know how that came to be your signature uh, know, place in terms of lyrics. How that came to be a way that you could be distinctive, explore the feelings, emotions, experiences that you had in a kind of timeless way that took it out of whatever was going on at the moment and made it feel like made it feel like history we didn't know about. Well, it without it it was so non-trendy what we were doing, um, not on purpose. Nobody was saying, let's do something different, or that, nothing like that. We just weren't drawn in a direction that was, you would hear something on the radio and say, let's do something like that. It just wasn't our, our calling. You guys don't seem to have radios. Like, there's no reference to somebody listening to a radio or having the car radio on as you're driving. You and then, yeah, down south we did, at WLAC, out of Nashville at the, at the time. But they were playing stuff that you never heard on regular radio. And that what, what was interesting and something to be drawn to. So I found out when in, 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 at Big Pink and the songwriting process that I had stored up something from that first train ride down to the Mississippi Delta to this you know, that we're calling the holy land of rock and roll, it had made such a profound impact on me. I was going to this place and everything, the moving, the rhythm of the Mississippi River, the sound of the towns, people's names, the way they talked, the way they walked, everything had this rhythm to it. And because I was 16 years old, it just washed over me. And something happened about my impression of this that it got stored away in a certain place. And when I started to write, these images came out because of being 16 years old and so impressionable. I never got rid of them. And so when I unlocked that door of that part in my memory and my imagination, this came streaming out, and there was another part to this too. Besides wanting to, part of my job in, in this group was to cast characters of the singers. I wanted to write so a song for Rick that I knew that he could tell that story as true as anybody could. I wanted to write songs for Richard 
that that character, that sadness in his voice would just cut right through you. And I wanted to write songs for Levon Helm that he could sing better than anybody in the world. How did you come to write The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down for Levon? Well, that's, you know, that's a, an obvious example of that. When I first, when I was, and I remembered vividly when I first, Levon took me to meet his folks in, uh, in Marvel, Arkansas, a little town, and, and his, his family was, they were cotton farms. Dad was a cotton farmer. Um, I mean, it's right out of a storybook. And they were just like beautiful people, tremendously Southern. I mean, Southern through and through. And one day his dad was telling me about the way things work around there in this part of the country. And that's just the way it is. And he was telling me this story and there was a certain sadness in it too. And then he said, he stopped and he said, but don't you worry, Robbie, the South is gonna rise again. <laughs> and it just sent a chill through me. And I remembered that. And then in the idea of, I, I need to write a song that, that Levon can do really, really good. And so it, it helped. It helped inspire me to get to a place to write uh, a song from the southern point of view of losing the war, and it, it made me write the night they drove a Dixie. What is it like as a songwriter hearing those words coming out of that mouth, hearing that voice sing that song? I mean, I, don't, I think everyone here has heard that and will never forget. Um, I, and I, I remember when we were recording that record and we were recording these songs and when we cut that, there was an undeniable truth to it. You know, there was something about that that you said, that's it, that's it. That's what we're looking for. That is a truth in music and nobody else is doing this. You were also reading screenplays at that time, and your work was being heavily influenced by some of the films you were seeing and the screenplays you were reading. And I think you cited some of those as you talked about how you wrote The Wait. Yeah, yeah, I've told this story before that um, the, I, I became a movie bug when I was quite young. And the deeper I got, the deeper I wanted to go. And after, after discovering, you know, John Ford and Hawks and Wells and many of the great American film directors, going deeper, then I started to discover Rossellini and Bergman and Karasawa and Bunuel and. And then I got stuck on Boonwell because th this guy had no rules. And I thought, this is healthy. Someone who just breaks down the boundaries and, and says, it's, it's all about imagination. And, and I saw a theme in, in, in some of his movies about people, the, about the impossibility of sainthood. The people were trying to be so good and everything, but there's a thing in human nature that balances that out. And just when you think that you're going to get heroic on yourself, something happens, and it just it, it just grounds you right back to zero. So thematically, when I was writing the weight about somebody just kind of you know on a mission to do something, and they said, "Oh, listen, while you're there, would you say hello to Joe?" Right? And you go to see Joe, and then, oh my God, your world turns upside down. And then you go down the road a little bit further, boom, and another thing happens. So it was, it, it was just an idea 
that I don't know that if I would have tripped over it without a, a little Lewis Boonwell in there. You did no, for off the first record, you did no press, you didn't do a tour, and yet there was a huge response to your music. What was the effect on the guys in the band to that, you know, of that success? How did they respond? Nobody quite knew, well, it wasn't, it became, it came off like this mysterious thing uh, what are those guys doing up there in the mountains? What are they, you know, why don't they come down? Why don't they show up? They're just, all we have is this sound and an image of these guys that don't look like anybody else. And, you know, we look like, kind of like grown men, but although we were, you know, just in our, you know, we're, you know early 20s and everything, but. It, it, it wasn't all, it wasn't a trick. What happened was, there was a, a, a terrible thing, a, 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 a ritual going on inside the band where flipping cars over became like a sport, you know? And so there was constantly, we were having these car wrecks you know, and every couple of days it'd be like, oh, you know, and I remember specifically, and, and for, it was near Kingston, New York, and that's where he would go to rent a car. And when Richard would show up, the people at Hertz would just pull down the blinds and turn on the lights and just pretend they're, 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 you know, there's nobody home. So anyway, in the course of this, Rick had a terrible car accident and he, he broke his neck and he was in traction for a long, long time. So we couldn't go out and play, but I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to tell anybody about this. So we had to just lay low and, they, and, and outside, in, in the outside world, they thought, mm -hmm, very mysterious. But it, we, we were just waiting for Rick to get better, really. <laughs> How did the scourge of, uh, you know, substance abuse and things like that begin to affect what was going on inside your group? Well, it does tend to get in the way. <laughs> you, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't unique in, the, in this group. So many musicians, so many bands, so many artists, so many people were experimenting. You know, we get coming in, in the 60s, it was an experiment, and everybody trying to find the light, and trying to find something that was cooler than the last thing. And, and, and it was, there was a, a, an innocence to it, too, that nobody was thinking, oh man, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna end up like uh, Billie Holiday and Charlie Nobody was thinking along those lines. Everybody was just thinking, you know, about an awareness. And the Beatles were experimenting, you know, with stuff. Everybody was experimenting with stuff. Now, what we didn't know at the time, we didn't know about the power of this thing, addiction. And that some people can dabble and other people, it gets stuck on them, and they can't let it go. And it gets, you know, and, and, and you get caught up in it. So as time went on, and the experimenting, it got dangerous. And it also causes a wall between someone who's doing it and someone who's not doing it. And it was the first, it was the first time ever with Levon that I felt a distance with, with him. And it was a bit heartbreaking to me too, but he was using heroin at the time and he lied to me. He sat right in front of me, looked me right in the eye and lied. And, and it was the first time ever we'd ever had anything like that. And so I had to understand it like, this is the effect of this drug doing this. 
he's not a bad person. It's that drug that is doing this. So what happens in all of this? And then other guys in the group were experimenting. But in so many bands, it was, it, 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 th this is not a special case. But in our personal life, it had a big effect. And it started to separate everybody. And Richard Manuel, bless his heart, you know, he had a worse problem um, than anybody in the group. He really, really struggled with addiction. And it was heartbreaking. And you did and we were so stupid at the time. We had no idea what to do, and we did all the wrong things. You know, we you know, now we are so much more knowledgeable and so much more aware. And now everything that we did was the first thing you shouldn't do, you know. And so anyway, we scrambled and we did the best we could with what we had, but it did it did cause damage. An album like uh, Stage Fright sort of conveys some of the turbulence and darkness that's going through your life at that time. Yeah, it, you know, and, and that's what I, I was saying before. Sometimes you try to hide behind the music, and sometimes the music just won't hide on you anymore. And I was writing songs like "You Don't Know the Shape I'm In," and "Stage Fright," and all all these other tunes that had started to rise to the surface. And it was a, and during that period, it it. it it was a tough time. We were struggling with it, and you know, we would say, "God, we we got work to do. We've got to, we, you know, we got to make some magic and everything. We can't make magic when we got you know one arm tied behind our back." And then you realize the power of addiction. You realize that it's no longer common sense. That has anything to do with it. We have a photograph also to show you, I think, of, uh, I think you're making Daniel and the Sacred Heart, this picture. I want to get a good look at it from where you were here. Can you see from here? All right, we might be able to see uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a little hint of what we're talking about in that picture, actually. Yeah, this was at the, uh, we were recording at the Woodstock Playhouse because we would, you know, we had this thing about finding an atmosphere and making it our own, rather than going into a sterile recording studio and and adapting to their atmosphere. So, after the Woodstock Festival, we were the only group from Woodstock to play at the festival. So, it didn't go over big with the locals and stuff. The people in the town thought it was our fault. <laughs> they thought, you guys, you guys, you know, everything was fine here until you guys showed up. And so, after the festival, we did the normal things. You would go to the bakery, you know, to pick up some things and everything. They wouldn't even look at you. They would just look away and you could feel this thing. So. I, I said, well, we, you know, we should do something because Woodstock had been terrific to us in, a, in, in some creative ways and, and we weren't happy about the effect that the Woodstock Festival had in the town. It was like a charming little art community until we got there and then all of this Volkswagen buses, as far as the eye could see, were, were showing up. Peace signs on them. Yeah. So I said, you know what? Why don't we do a concert and do a, our new record live in front of the townspeople of Woodstock? Just, just us at the beautiful Woodstock Playhouse. It's all wood, it's beautiful. And so anyway, so Albert, our manager, he goes to the town's uh, council and tells them this idea, and they hated it. <laughs> they hated it. They said, it'll be all people from New Jersey and, you know, New York in there. We'll never yeah. get in, you know. So anyway, they completely dissed that idea. 
So we ended up making the stage fright record 